Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of Club Moffat Talks. Joining us today is our provost, Marcy Marsden. But before that, my name is Chris. I am your host and instruction librarian. And I'm Joseph, and I'm also an instruction librarian. I'm Allison. I'm the marketing and outreach coordinator, and I'm coming to you today from our Mustang studio over here at the library. It's our new podcast studio that anyone can book, any faculty, staff, student can book to come over here and do audio recording for a podcast or presentation or anything like that. So that's what you're seeing behind me. Oh, I'm uh, Dr. Marcy Brown. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Marcy Brown Marsden, I am the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Midwestern State University. Very, very excited to have you on and talk to you today. Uh, before we kind of go into our main topic, we like to go around and just kind of talk about what we've been doing lately. Um, usually I don't go first, but I'm just going to say I haven't done anything lately. Uh, my my six-month-old learned how to roll over and um, I go home and brain turns off for a bit. So that's all I've been doing lately. Yeah. I I was really amused when your kids were in the library last week with uh, your elder daughter's ability to imitate uh, Donald Duck. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. She's really good at that. Uh, we're going to try to get her into Donald Duck impersonations here soon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you were amused by that. Um, me and her mother were not very amused by her behavior in the library, but um, you know what? If she can make, she can put a smile on people's faces right now, that's just fine. Well, I, I know that there are people that would say it's it's particularly good in my case. Some people get a, a grumpy old man vibe off of me, and they're like, hey, that made him smile. That must be really special. So, yeah. Hey, if that's the case, she she doesn't think about think that about you at all because as soon as she comes to the library, she runs to either my office or your office and starts playing with with everything in your office. So, yeah. Good job. Well, it's I it's it's a little bit funny because viewing my shelves behind me in here, it it might come off that I have some sort of like child lore here, <laughs> you know, it's like Come to me. Uh, and and it's really not that. All of these are for me to play with. All of these things are things that I have played with, uh, you know, in the past and stuff. And 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 I have them around me because they make me happy. Uh, if a child comes in and plays with it, I was like, eh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> but now that's what these are for. These are my um uh small Gundam models my wife got me for Christmas for a few years now. And that's what they are. They're not just here for Whatever, they're just here for me to mess with every now and then. Uh, so uh, since you've already kind of jumped in, Joe, what have you been got going on lately? I, I am sad to say that I have not been doing very much reading. Um, I We have uh, the book that Athena and I are reading together at night. We're doing a chapter of a book each night. We're doing the Wheel of Time series. We're on the third book, The Dragon Reborn, about halfway through it. Um, and we're enjoying sharing the time together in that fantasy world. Um, but other than that, I haven't really been doing a lot of reading. There's a book that I was given at Christmas that I really wanted, and I really wanted to read, and it has been sitting on my nightstand. And I'm just, I, I've read, it's, it's kind of an anthology, so it's not a, a big story arc that I have to follow, uh, it has short stories. It's uh, the essential border town, and uh, I I've read a, a few chapters from it, and just have not been able to pick it up and and finish it. I actually have an other book that I was also given at Christmas that I was really excited about, and I haven't even opened it. It yeah. just really? something just I I don't have the bandwidth for it or or something right now. On the other hand. We've been watching a lot of streaming things. Um, I, I tend to find TV series after they've ended. Uh, we're we're watching the series Black Sails, which I knew was piratey, but I did not know is like this epic prequel to Treasure Island. 
the character John Silver is a main character in that TV series. Oh. Um, and I did not know that, but I've been watching that. It's only four seasons long and we've gotten to the fourth season. Uh, the other thing we've been watching is we've been watching some old Hitchcock movies, specifically mm. like the uh, Jimmy Stewart ones. Um, I like Jimmy Stewart and I hate his character in almost all of those. <laughs> He's terrible. Um, in uh, in Rear Window, he plays a man who's trying to decide whether or not Grace Kelly is worth him dating. Uh, in uh, in Rear Window, uh, n- uh, no, not Rear Window. Uh, in in Vertigo, he has a friend who he dated in college. Uh, who's obviously madly in love with him and that he cares about enough that he goes and sees her really regularly, goes over to her apartment all the time, but they're not dating. He gets obsessed with some other woman and just by the end of the movie has completely lost his mind and become unhinged. Uh, And then uh, his version of the man who knew too much. And I have to say that because Hitchcock made the same movie twice because there's a version of uh, The Man Who Knew Too Much from the 30s with Peter Lorre, uh, and Jimmy Stewart did basically the same movie in the 50s. Um, And he plays the husband in a couple that is the ugly Americans. They are terrible. And the wife is Doris Day. Jimmy Stewart and Doris Day play this really terrible couple. Okay, I don't think you're supposed to think that they're terrible. They just are. They're in uh, like uh, Marrakesh and they have zero concern about any kind of cultural taboos or uh, anything. They have a son that they let walk up and down the aisles of this bus. He accidentally snatches the veil off of a woman's face. That woman's husband freaks out and is all like, I'm going to have to murder this little boy now. And someone intercedes on their behalf who can translate for them. But they never apologize. They never discipline their son, who still is holding the veil and has to be, has to get it pried out of his hands to give back to the man and his wife. They are horrible. They go to a restaurant and they're very specifically told that in their culture, they only eat with one hand. And they have like the really low sitting uh, next to the low table. And and they just kind of are very dismissive and kind of mocking of it the whole time, like, these people don't know how to eat, kind of a thing. And Jimmy Stewart ends up eating with both hands, and like the uh, guy that runs the restaurant is like, sir, what are you doing? And he's just like, ugh, these people. It's like, terrible. Terrible, I've got, terrible, terrible. I've got five words to dismiss all criticisms of Hitchcock movies. Okay. You ready for this? Sure. It was a different time. Okay. I I I I hear you. <laughs> and I'm going to step on your feet. Okay. Because uh it wasn't. It wasn't a different time. Uh it was not this particular time, but it's still the same. It's like some someone was talking about that using, oh, he's from a different time to dismiss the um racist or sexist or just anything that's unsympathetic or unkind behavior of a grandfather or, you know, the uncle that you just have to invite to family gatherings, even though nobody wants him to be there. And talking about, well, you know, he's from a different time. No, he's not. He's right here at our table. He's he's in our time. Okay. I'm being facetious, but yeah, I do agree with that. <laughs> you know, so it's like, uh, no, it's like, uh, my my grandmother was probably the same age as Hitchcock. She was completely kind. The same time <laughs> period. Uh, no, no, it's just just bad, just badness, completely unnecessary badness. That was a huge rant. I <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I'm going to apologize for that huge rant, but I recognize that it was a huge rant. So, um, Allison, <laughs> would you like to say to say what's going on with you or? <laughs> 
I actually had a follow up on what you said, not about Hitchcock, but you said you you and your wife are reading the book right now and you'll read a chapter and I, I'm curious, do y'all each have your own copy and you read by yourselves or does like one of you read the chapter aloud? Uh, I've been reading it out loud. Uh, that is a thing that we started doing as a family 20, 25 years ago. Uh, my parents had done it with us a little bit, uh, but we did a thing with our kids where we would do a nightly reading of the Harry Potter books, mm -hmm. and one of us would read a chapter out loud each night. Uh, and doing that was actually really awesome because we had the the, the hardback versions of those, and uh, we would actually take turns reading. Uh, I did a lot of them, but Athena did some, and the kids took turns reading uh which was amazing um and that's one of the things about it's why libraries are important folks uh reading is so important to intellectual and cultural and social development um and it was a, it, i think that it made our kids better people and it made our family stronger to share that time together uh but yes we are reading out loud um, we have a shared library on our electronic tablet uh, so that any book we buy on that platform goes to the shared library. Um, so either of us could read any of the books in there independently, and, and we do, but those were just uh, reading out loud together. Well, that sounds so nice. I, I think you're right, too, about you said it made your family stronger, and I think that's true. It's bonding time and it's just nice to do something like that. I, besides like, you know, when you're little and your parents read to you and help you do like your books that you bring home for school, I don't think my family much did that past probably like those ages, mm -hmm. but that sounds so nice. I think that's so sweet to like read together each night, even if it's just a chapter and it's good to get in reading. Cause I'm real bad about, I want to read and I'll be like, oh, I should read before bed. I should read a couple chapters, but then I'll be like, oh, I've, I have to do this. I have to do, you know, and put it off. But to just be like, we're going to sit down and do this chapter each night. It keeps you meeting your goals. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, as... and Marcy, if you ever want to just jump in, just interrupt oh, yeah. us because otherwise we're just going to, that's why we started doing the <laughs> video in the first place sure. because there would just be long tracks of time where we were, we were like, I want to interrupt. I don't know if they're done talking yet. Mm -hmm. So if you have anything you want to add into this conversation, please, by all means, it's totally fine. Well, I guess a couple of things I've just picked up. First, I, I think I need to look into black sales because my my husband and son read at night together. They or he, you know, he reads to to my son. That's their thing that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, I'll have to recommend that because they had read Treasure Island at, at bedtime. What, um, what is the age of, of the He's child? eight, so maybe not yet. Maybe no, not no. Later. Uh, the, okay, that helps. The, uh, the the black sales uh it, it was okay this is not factually accurate but for mm -hmm. thematic elements it was like made by the same people as game of thrones that makes sense uh, but, okay well, I, mean, I think that my husband and i now found something because we've been we've been um going back we, we decided to rewatch breaking bad recently so we just decided oh. to go back to that and so we're 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 not very far along in the first season you know we've seen it and then all the you know this better call Saul and el camino and all that stuff so so we may have to add that because we sometimes you, know, you get to the point where you're trying to figure out what to, to watch and, and you're not sure. And so you have to start on something. Um, the other strategy we have is to um, we pick a, an actor, um, a monthly actor, and then try to watch a lot of the stuff that they've done. And so you go through, you find someone who has a pretty deep filmography, and then you have some choices that you can make um, to, to find out. Sometimes you can pick like a, a you know, main actor and, and, and follow their, their, um, their trajectory. But sometimes you find a, a character actor or somebody who's a side character. So I'll tell you one of the best ones to, to, um, we did that with was Danny Trejo. You pick Danny mm -hmm. Trejo, he's in tons of stuff. And so you've got lots of films that you can watch, right? Because he's in a, a bunch of different, different things. You could see the different roles he plays in his evolution. And now, um, you know, you can go to, to somebody who's written recently won an award or something like that and follow their trajectory. Um, Charlize Theron is online right now because mm -hmm. she's got a pretty, I, I, I like a lot of her films. They've got the new Furiosa that she's not in, but, you know, seeing, seeing other things that she's done. I really, she's done, uh, taken a lot of, um, 
acting choices that are, um, you know, a stretch uh, sometimes. And then, but she managed to be glamorous, but also very, very toned down in a lot of things. So um, as far as, so reading my son and my husband just finished um, a child's version of, of Moby Dick. Um, so they read that um, to go through and they had done the Hobbit before that. They're not for Lord of the Rings just yet. And then um, there's a Sherlock Bones series, so they're reading that one right now. So they tend to pick something and they read it for for a few months and so forth, or a few weeks. Um, and then for for me, um, uh, if it's okay if I talk about what I read, um, uh, so I I love love have to read. Um, it's it's a necessity that I have to read um, for for a fun and enjoyable thing. Um, so for me, uh, I just. Uh, so the last couple books I've picked, unfortunately, what it meant is that I had to go back and reread something else because to be able to understand context um, and remind myself of that. So for example, um, there's a book uh, just I've recently finished called James, which is by Percival Everett. Um, and it's a, a retelling of the um, the story of, of Jim from Huck Finn, a, restore, a retelling of Huck Finn from Jim's perspective. Mm -hmm. And so um, so it's it's interesting sort of why do they speak the way they do in, in Huck Finn is sort of there's an explanation of that. But to do that, I had to go back and reread Huck Finn, which I realized I'd never really actually read before because I know it. there's many things, you know, from culture and not from personal consumption. And so I think I, I had to go back and re read that to make sure I understood the references and so forth. Uh, there was an author who put out a book, um, a sequel to a book that his first one had written in, and I'd read, I think it was eight or nine years ago. And so I had to go reread that one before I could read the new, new uh, no, the sequel to that book. So I had to go reread that. Um, and then now I'm reading, um, I just was on a plane yesterday and I read most of it. Um, which is um, Knife by Salman Rushdie. Um, it's a, Oh, it's, how is that? It's it's wonderful. It really is great. Um, it's a telling of his experience having been attacked two years ago um, by someone who was prompted by some of the, by the fatwa and some of uh, his cultural understanding of what Salman Rushdie had done. And so he attacked him with a knife at a Chautauqua event and he, his recovery. So the story is, is him telling his own story of recovery from this injury and the people who care for him and what he's, you know, he's gone through in that. And you have this amazing author who's doing that. Um, his book, Victory City, which I read when it came out, came out during his recovery. He'd written it, he'd done galleys and so forth on it. And, and, and then it got released. So he was unable to do an author tour because he was recovering from the loss of his eye and other injuries sustained during the, the attack. And uh, so that has made me, reading that has made me want to go back and reread Satanic Verses just to make sure. I don't think I understood it at the time I read it when I was in college, exactly what was this controversial about it. So it's interesting reading Knife, which, so I would, uh, Chris, I highly recommend the book. It's it's really well done. He 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 fictionalizes a conversation with his attacker in as one of the chapters in the book. Oh. Um, and he won't even refer to the attacker as his 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 real name. He'll only refer to him as A for assassin, um, or a, a, a attempted assassin. Um, but it's it's fascinating to read. It really is interesting. Um, it's about being an author, being a target, being a, um, being someone who 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 engages in a creative process and sees the consequences potentially of of doing that. You know. So I highly recommend that. You know, what, an interesting aside with with um, just. Salman Rushdie's attack and him releasing this book is um I'm my wife and I really really like Curb Your Enthusiasm it's one of mm -hmm. our favorite shows and as we were watching through I think I think it was the first time we were watching it maybe might have been a rewatch I don't know but it was um we were re-watching the season where Larry has a, a fatwa put on him mm -hmm. and there's there's an episode where he uh speaks with Salman Rushdie about like safety and protecting himself and uh, just trying to avoid uh, assassination and they have this really long conversation and it completely derails from that and it was maybe a month later after we watched that one episode that his uh, that news of his attack came out and it was just so like whenever things just kind of I, I don't know what the phrase is exactly but um when it's serendipitous like that, where mm -hmm. that's fresh on your mind and something new happens with it, and it's mm -hmm. it really, these things really shouldn't just coincide like that, but it's just these weird accidents. I always find it fascinating when when yeah. things like that happen. 
No, and it's interesting. Well, he he talks in the book about the fact that um, one of uh, the, the main character in, in Victory City is blinded at the end of the book. Like she's blinded as a as a um, a, a punishment. Um, she's she's eventually punished for for some things that she's done. And they ask, you know, did you rewrite that section to to correspond to what you'd experienced? He said, no, it just happened that way. That that this character he had written had experienced. Um, being blinded. And, and so he talks about that being one of his greatest fears. He said, actually, the reason it was in there is because one of his greatest fears in his life is being blinded. Um, and then it made its way into this, this work and then it, it made it ways to his life. And wow. so he, he talks a little bit also about the fatwa that he said, you know, at the time when it happened, when he was in the UK, he, the, the, it was begrudging that he received security details and it was mainly when he was going to be at something public event his day-to-day -day life was not covered but the security detail let's say if he was on an appearance at something would be covered because it was potentially a public um the public could be harmed right um he talked about them later trying to go back to after his his um his attack going back to to uk to visit family um because he went to cambridge and and you know he he had familiarity with with the uk but then going back to see his family and the British government bending over backwards to try to protect him, that there was a lot of sympathy because he, they had seen the consequences potentially of what had happened that to individually, that he individually had experienced something and attacked very publicly. Um, and even if it was only something targeting him, how much it impacted the broader literary community, his family, his friends, the, the, the community psyche and so forth. It was really interesting to read. So I'm, I'm nearly finished with that. I'm kind of anxious to see uh, where it goes, because he he also talked about his his wife um, filming some of his experience in the hospital and and sort of they're I think putting out a documentary. I don't think it's been released, but it'll be coming out too. So I'm anxious to see that as well. Very interesting. Yeah, that sounds so good. I also think what you mentioned too about picking an actor mm -hmm. and doing that for like a month and watching what I think that is a very cool idea and very smart. Like to really get into their filmography you mm -hmm. could even do it with like a director too and watch That's everything true. someone's directed and stuff it seems really cool kind of a, and I like what you said too about picking a character actor because mm -hmm. then they're in so many different projects where they're just in the side but then it kind of means you're watching all these different things for this one person doing all these different like uh characters yeah, you see the cool. flexibility because you yeah. know you're you're watching it. You know you know, you've know, experienced this, I'm sure, where you're watching a film, watching a a, a show, something like that, and you see this person, you're like, oh my gosh, that's so mm -hmm. and so and so in this other movie, and you start to connect, make the connection, you know, and you see how how plastic they can be in different different film roles, and sometimes you know the character actors don't have as much plasticity as you might have remembered. Yeah. <laughs> they always play a certain character and everything, but um, so many of them are good. We, we, it, this all began several years ago with um, Denzel Washington. We decided we just, oh. mm -hmm. and what's hard, uh, what was hard about that, you know, there's some wonderful movies he's made, right? I mean, it's just amazing ones. He does not do comedy, right? So you, you pick an actor like Denzel Washington, you're just going to get serious work. You're, you're not going to have a break from that. It's going to be somebody who's, and then the, we're sometimes prompted sadly by the fact, like if an actor passes, you know, you, somebody's passed away and you mm -hmm. think, oh, we should watch some more of his stuff. And so we've done that actually for longer than we've done this monthly person. But uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the things to try to say, okay, show your honoring this person by going back and seeing. So we've done that with Ian Holm because he's been in just numerous things, right? And so seeing when he passed, we went back and looked at a lot of his his earlier works. And he played Napoleon and all kinds of other character roles. Oh yeah. What's really fascinating about that is whenever you do that with a director and they have a certain voice, like they have their own style that that's just clearly connected to them. And you'll watch something that if it was any other director, it would be like, mortifying or it would be deeply sad but then you'll watch something by like david lynch and something that should be like just the most horrific thing ever is like like side splittingly funny just because you understand his voice and you know that he's not being serious about it like i, I love whenever you can you can understand a director's standpoint or their voice enough that you can be like oh i get what you're doing here well, you also can see too, there's a team that they work with, you know, and you start to respect some of the cinematographers and the editors and so forth that they work with. Like Martin Scorsese has worked with the same editor, Thelma Schumacher, for decades. And so you see that they're that she she's there sort of seeing all this film that he's created and then trying to to edit it into something cohesive that that still honors the director's vision, but also shows that we also honor the the 
um, viewers time that we're not going to make it a four hour, 10 hour movie. We're going to make it into something that's, that's, that's reasonably concise. So um, I think that's, what's really interesting too, is you get somebody who's worked with the same sound people or the same effects people. And, and you see that thematically go through, even um, with the, the, the um, music that they do with the film, that if they worked with the same person doing some of their, their, um, their, the music has been, it's pretty interesting to, to see how they, they have a good relationship like that. Yeah. That makes me think of, um, the man, I think his name's uh, Ludwig, who won the Oscar for the Oppenheimer music. Oh, yeah. He's been yeah, working yeah. with Christopher Nolan for a little bit now. And That's a good tell, example. Yeah, yeah, they have like a good, you can tell in the music like that they, and from other stuff they've done together, that they have a good relationship. And you're right, too. Like, I think Christopher Nolan's worked with similar, the same cinematographers mm -hmm. and things and editors and you can see that you're right, like that relationship play out in different stories. Yeah. Was it was it Quentin Tarantino who worked with Ania Morricone for like most of their most of his career and they just hated each other? I'm or not sure if it was him or it was um uh no. Um although I'm trying to think Quentin Tarantino probably tried to borrow a lot from what Morricone had done in his music. Um was it Sergio No. Yeah, it was someone like that. It was like an Italian composer, something like that. Yeah. They hated each other, but they always worked together because, like, they they were like on the same creative wavelength. Mm -hmm. That's something that I just I think is just really special. Whenever you have two people like that, yeah, I think it's um, who is it? James Cameron works with Horner a lot, I think, mm. and uh, uh, who? Well, of course, John Williams. You know, seeing him working with the directors he's worked with often. Um, so, or the series that the, he's developed those thematic elements. Although it's starting to sound very similar i guess over yeah. the time. <laughs> when you've written so much you know you you start to repeat yourself after a while no you call it motifs and just motifs exactly that's it yeah that's true uh allison did you have anything that was going on this last few these last few days um i've been kind of watching a lot of different things and i did i'm finally reading a little bit more again i just finished a book this weekend actually one of our co-workers amanda the interlibrary loan a specialist here she let me borrow a book called six of crows it's um part of a duology that's kind of like a not a not like exactly a sequel but it's set in the same universe as this other YA series shadow and bone and it's kind of about this like magical heist of like these six characters that get together to go break this guy out of prison and it's like all about the shenanigans that ensue with that. And it was really good. It was very fun. The cast of characters was really cool. And I was talking to Amanda, who let me borrow the book earlier today when I returned it to her. And one thing I really liked is there. it surprised me. I feel like sometimes when you read a lot, even if the book is well written and it's a good book, sometimes you can just predict what's going to happen because you just know, like, you know, the themes of things are kind of like the tropes that stuff falls into. But there were multiple times while reading the book that I was surprised by stuff and not even like in a, oh my gosh, that's a crazy plot twist, but just like little things like reveal, like things revealed about the characters that I was like, oh, I never would have guessed that about that character so it was really nice and now i'm looking forward to reading the second one because it's a duology and it left off on a cliffhanger so what was the I'm first happy. one called uh what was it what what was the first one called uh six of crows okay it's called that because it's well six of them and then they're part of this gang like the crows well their gang's not called the crows but it's like kind of a name for them so but that was really fun and i'm happy to be into reading again and then i'm trying to start an audiobook this month too for pride month called um cleat cute it's kind of hard to say when you like together but it's supposed to be like a sapphic story about soccer players mm -hmm. and i want to get into that kind of like to celebrate pride month and read something along those lines mm -hmm. um as for tv i've watched a couple things i mentioned it earlier off uh, the podcast to Chris, but I watched um, the One Piece live action show and I've never seen the anime or read the manga or anything to do with it. We just randomly decided to put it on and I thought it was as someone who hasn't seen the other stuff, so I have nothing to go off of, you know, no ties to the original material. I really enjoyed it and thought it was very fun. I thought the acting was good. The story was interesting. And I do like that 
it kind of had like really serious moments which was interesting because lots of times in anime you don't even in the serious moments it can still be jokey because that's just how anime is but I liked kind of the playfulness tied in with like the seriousness so I really enjoyed that and then right now I'm re-watching The Boys on Amazon Prime because the fourth season's coming out this Thursday so I want to be caught up with remembering everything that happened in the first three seasons and that's mostly oh sorry one more thing and then this weekend I watched the new movie with Glenn Powell Hitman that's in theaters and on Netflix and that was really good I enjoyed it a lot but yeah I've kind of been reading and watching a lot of things recently my wife wanted to watch Hitman and I hadn't heard anything about it other than it, it got like standing ovations at Venice or something like that. So that's, it's that's basically, good. yeah, it's like, it's basically about like this guy who's working with the police department, the local police department to um pose as a hitman to kind of for people who try to get a hitman. And then he works with the police and the people who meet with them, you know, he gets them like that. But it's also kind of a romance because like halfway through the movie there's like a romance plot introduced that becomes a big part of the movie but it's also apparently slightly based on a true story not completely but like the man who like uh the main character glenn powell is playing it's like kind of based off of a man who did the same thing like pretending to be a hitman it was really interesting i thought it was (sighs) very fun it was funny the timing and pacing was good on it I really liked it. I thought it was good. I wish it could be in theaters longer before Netflix because I feel bad when movies don't get to have their theatrical run properly and they just automatically they're on streaming. But I mean, it's nice to have it accessible for everyone. I I think that it's better for us as consumers to have some of that accessibility on, on a streaming service uh i think that a lot of us haven't gotten back to normal from covid in 2020 and also just because we like stayed at home so much more we really developed the the recognition that outside is terrible uh Mm. because there's people out there and people are the worst (laughs) you know why would you go to a theater library workers by the way in it you know to watch something you could watch at home on in the comfort of your own couch with your own food made the way that you like it uh but uh we we saw the hitman movie this weekend and we had uh like athena and i hadn't really heard heard about it but uh caitlin and michael had come over to hang out and we were trying to decide what we were going to do with ourselves and I said, well, let's watch this movie. And so we watched the trailer for it. And then we watched the movie. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was, I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it was fun too. I think there's sometimes though you can't, I mean, going back to the question of going to, to, I mean, I know for us as parents, you know, we don't get out often and some movies are exceptionally long. I'm just going to say that it's a long commitment to being out there. And so sometimes our, our levels of tiredness can only handle ha- a movie in halves. And so <laughs> that, that gives you the option when you're streaming it um, to watch it in halves. We just watched um, uh, four things, um, which was the, oh, um, one of the Oscar nominees. And it was, it was really good, really great. Cause he has a, another movie coming out soon and he's working with Emma Stone again. Mm-hmm. So I'm Ooh. anxious to see, I had, you know, I like that particular director. And so I, I think that's the this this will be the third one then i think they worked on another movie before poor things yeah and i'm trying to remember the name of it yeah the favorite uh, the favorite that, oh, that that's it yeah that one was great too we enjoyed that one a lot so um so i think that we weren't sure you know when we were trying to pick it up on streaming whether we could watch it all in one sitting or not we wound up doing that but still it's like touch and go if we all just fall asleep then we gotta pause it and then just go back to it um it's like um and then you know the, the oscar nominees we also try to work through all those when they come out right. and so um the the scorsese the pillars of flower i mean we want to see that but that's a three-hour film and so that's definitely gonna have to be watched in pieces unfortunately and i realize that's not it doesn't honor the <laughs> the filmmaker's intent to see you know in one sitting to you know but unfortunately no just, those no i can't do it anymore <laughs> No, you're so right, though. I love watching movies and halves. I love watching half, pausing, and then being like, all right, I'm going to come back the next day. 
and finish this because sometimes you really just don't have even the attention span to sit down it's like I want to appreciate this I don't want to play on my phone because I'm like having trouble focusing so sometimes it's better to just pause it though I'm sure there's probably some film buffs he would be like put them on the put them on trial put them on the stakes how dare they say that <clears throat> you know <laughs> I, I had to do that with Rise of the Skywalker and I will never watch that movie again that was yeah that, I paused that movie halfway through and I said I'll I'll, I'll come back to this um, but yeah, you know, there's a, there's a big talk about uh, tons and tons of movie theaters shutting down right now, actually, because that's like that's kind of the theme that people have had re recently is like, oh, I can watch movies in the comfort of my own home, and I don't have to go to a dirty, stinky, sticky, cold movie theater to watch like the new movie, and it might not even be that good. The last one we saw was Dune Part One. And I'm perfectly fine having watched the second one just in the comfort of my own home. I really wish I had gotten to see Godzilla minus one in the theater, though. I, I'm still really salty about that. Since it came to Netflix, I've seen it twice already. Yeah. Um, I will watch it again really, really soon, too. Yeah, sometimes it has to be something. It has to be something to really drive me to get me there. Like I went to see Challengers in theaters, and that's because I worship the grounds and Daya walks on. Wow. Oh. So, so you've seen Dune Part 2 then? Yeah, I saw Dune okay. Part 2 in theaters as well. Well, that was because I actually watched the first one like on, um, what was it, on Max? I watched mm -hmm. the first one right before going to see Dune 2 with the coworker I mentioned earlier, Amanda. Um, She wanted to go see it. And I was like, all right, let me watch this first one, get that under out of the way. <laughs> and then I was like, all right, right into the second one, mm -hmm. which was really fun. But yeah, it has to be kind of something like that that I know is going to be cinematic. Or it has to have someone that I really love that I'm like, all right, I'll go to the theater. Um, along this line, though, of like movies, books, reading, you mentioned to us that you like to do this thing, an annual goal, where you try and read um, all 13 books on the Booker long list. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask you, I have a couple questions about it and we can see what we'll what we can get into but I was curious first like how long have you been doing that like trying because you said it was an annual goal so how long have you yeah. been doing that so I'm gonna say it goes back who it's hard to remember I date things by how old my son is but so before my son so he's eight <laughs> so at least I know that it happened started happening before before he came along so um yeah uh I Part of it is, you know, you, you struggle as with you do with films, you know, you have to have something that drives you to say, okay, what's going to be my set of things to read potentially mm -hmm. if you're not, if you're not able to, to see what's coming along. So it's, it's the same way as like picking a, a, an actor to watch their, you know, more of their filmography. It's sort of saying, okay, this is, I think what I like about that list, it's, it's curated, right? There are judges that have curated this list of 13 books that they, they bring forward. And um, many of them are uh, debut novels. Some of them are, are not, some of them are novelists who've been writing for a long time. And so you get diversity in terms of authors, um, ascendancy into their, into their work. Right. Uh, so that's one, one positive reason to do it. It's, it's UK based. So the book of prizes is, is based on the UK. And so they have a little bit more diverse list of, of reads that, that you could, you could pick up that are, you know, compared to, let's say, if you're going to read the New York Times bestseller list, you know, and, and so many of those lists are driven by sales and also foes, mm -hmm. sales, right? They're not really, you know, you could read a Pulitzer Prize list would probably be comparable, but it's very America centric. So I like the, the, the Booker Prize because it does involve a lot of different, different, um, people from different cultures and different experiences. And so, uh, and then there's just about the right amount of time, um, on a, on a good week, I guess I can read about a book a week, um, if, if I maybe slightly more depending on it, you know, what I'm looking at. Uh, and so, so they announce it usually the list is in it in July and they, they announce the, the winners. And, um, I think it's now moved a little bit later in October, but, um, so they, they have, they, they come up with a long list and they'll cut it to a short list of six and then they'll, they'll, they'll give the, the winner. And so it's always interesting to sort of read through them and say, okay, what, what do I think I would, select as, as the winner, um, because, you know, you just sort of, you know, it's me as my personal taste. I'm not a panel of judges who can, you can look at things, but, uh, you know, they, they, 
and then trying to look at you know where the author's from if it is their debut novel or if it's something that they they've been around for a while um and then what kind of genre it's it's in you know what what sort of source or material that they're they're talking about so i i really enjoy doing that just to to go through it the the author i wanted to win the booker prize this last year didn't win but i i also liked the one that did win so um and so i read i'd read both and appreciated both both were irish authors too so this was a year where they had more Irish authors on the list and the first Irish winner in some time. Hmm. So that's cool. Is your um track record good for usually picking the same winner that they pick? Um y- yes. Um uh 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 I'm trying to think. So there was a year uh can't remember what year it was, but Shuggy Bane won. That was a really very good, very good novel. I mean it's terrible to read because it was so heartbreaking but it was an amazing novel to have read. And I thought that that one has stuck with me so powerfully. Um, there was one a few years, um, trying to remember the title. Um, that was one of, it's one of the problems. It's hard to remember 13 books every year. <laughs> the titles are really too good. Um, I write them down. So that's at least helpful because my memory is not as strong. Um, but uh, there was one that was uh, based in, in um, South Africa and I didn't really care for it as much as, and it had won the, the award. So I, it was, it was based on white South Africa, which I, maybe I just, it didn't, it didn't jive very well <laughs> with me. Um, and then the one this last year, um, it was uh, Paul Lynch, um, Prophet Song, and that was the winner. And I, it, it's a dystopian somewhat. So it's, I kind of have, I have a, an undercurrent of enjoyment of dystopian sort of things as well. <laughs> so I did like it, even though it wasn't my top pick. Um, um, the, the end of the one that I, I wanted to win was, uh, it's called The Bee Sting. And you're at the end and I was just, you know, one of those books where you're racing at the end, like, oh my God, what happens? And then it didn't resolve at the end. And so you're just thinking, ah, you know, so that's what you're left with. And you think, okay, what is that? that the author, you know, is trying to give you that, that it doesn't resolve. You want resolution, but it it doesn't happen that way. You don't know. And you're in, 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 in able to see what possible directions it's headed. But so anyway, I, I, I'm waiting for that to come out in July because summer is a good time, of course, to, to read. And, and mm-hmm. so that's, and it gives me a, a reliable list. The only challenge I've had with the Booker list is the fact that they're, uh, because it's, it's UK based, some of those books have not been released in the United States. <laughs> and so you're looking at their, you know, so you're, you know, you want to read it and it comes out in the US in November and that's by the time it's over. So oh. um, uh. I'm lucky that I'm married to, to a, a Brit. So he goes over every summer. <laughs> <laughs> the books up for me and I can order them to his dad's house and he can he can bring them back home so I can import them through my 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 agent there in the uh, in the UK do they ever pick books that are not like translated into English so they have a separate list actually it's really good um they have a separate list of um international booker which are translated novels um so you can also go to that and that is that list is released earlier I think it's already out so you can look at the international booker list or, and I've looked at a few there as well. Some of them are older novels that were released in their original language several years ago, and they've only just been translated. Mm. Um, and so you're able to read those. There was one, um, uh, oh gosh, the memory police, um, which was an amazing one, um, that I read a few years ago. And, uh, that was from the international booker. Interesting. Okay. Oh Yeah. You said that the other one that you just mentioned stuck with you, the one that was hard to read. I was curious, though, because you've been doing this now for a while. Has there been any books that you've read for, you know, the list and then it turns out to be one of your all time favorites or a book that you end up going back to? And you're like, I'm so glad I discovered this through this challenge. Yeah, there's some there's some that have um, have have really made it in terms of, um, yeah, you, you, you rated us as one of the tops that are on your list. Um, there was, um, and I'm going to ba- mess up the title, the seven moons of, Oh, anyway, it, that was one from two years ago, I believe. And that one has, has also stuck. It's, it's about the, the Bardo, the, the, the or what we would call the Bardo, the, the liminal space between life and death. Um, oh. and so, um, it's a really, really good one. It stuck with me too. The scenes are really hard to, to drop. And so you kind of think, and, and really, you know, it's one of those things that these are, these are probably novels that are, are absolutely unfilmable. <laughs> they're, they're not ones you're going to see except by reading, you know, um, maybe they would be adapted at some point in time. I think Wolf Hall was one of those that won several years ago that was, has been made into something, but 
a lot of the ones I've read have not. And also, honestly, a lot of people don't know, <laughs> don't know the, the, the books when I talked to them, I was like, I read this. And it's like, mm, you know, you don't know where it all came from, but if you, if you, it's, it's interesting to follow sort of once you start to, to follow that list and start to see, you know, reading about the, um, the judges and how they pick the novels, they do a really wonderful, um, program when they they release like they have uh, that's really geeking out to be honest I'm, I apologize um but <laughs> they have a whole show that they run of like leading into the announcement of the winner and they 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 have actors um interpreting some of the scenes from the book which is really great um so they have some reading the scenes and and uh and that that's really great too so they have this whole um this whole option to to kind of hear somebody speaking it in, in you know this really profound way, and and then you get the announcement live, and then you get to, so I, I I'll, I'll have it tracking on my phone <laughs> and try to watch the, the actual program when they announce it. Oh, so, that's yeah, great! That's yeah, that's very cool. And you never have to apologize for geeking out. That's literally what this podcast is for. Sure. That's the whole point of it. <laughs> Were you here for the first half hour? Of- <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's all we do here. I think people are surprised though, you know, so I'll say that, um, you know, I, I guess in, in our household, I mean, you, you've all talked about this a little bit, but when, you know, we have books everywhere, we have books everywhere at home and it's just been part of our lives. My husband and I were married 15 years before my son came along and we had this amazing collection of books. And so what's great is that that is his culture. That is his life, that he sees books on the wall and, and that he also feels that he can walk up and grab one and, and read it when he wants to. And so he'll, he'll occasionally pick up one. He had one on the civil war that he was really interested in. He said, is that a book about the civil war? It's like, yeah. Or when he, he says what, you know, he'd heard something about Moby Dick, I think. And it's like, do you know? And I'm like, okay, let me tell you about Moby Dick. All right. So, <laughs> so unfortunately then he got a lecture cause I'm an academic. Um, but he, you know, then he can go pick up the book. I mean, it's right there. You know, he's seen it before. And so his collection now has grown and it's all over our house. And so we're, we're, it's family that decorates with books in our house. And so that's, there's worse things, I think. Um, but, you know, I think that people sometimes, you know, I've heard from some faculty, oh, I don't read, I don't read. I'm like, oh, you know, I can't imagine not reading. Um, and I don't mean to judge anybody that way, but, you know, people do them, you know, do what they, they like to do, but you know, I, for me, I'm a person who cannot sleep until I've read, you know, that, that doesn't, I don't, I don't fall asleep until I go through that rhythm, that pattern of reading something. Um, and so no, it doesn't matter how tired I am, <laughs> it'll still happen. Uh, so Suzanne Shipley, when she was here, um, uh, she, she talked about how reading was her rest. And I was like, oh, okay, I can see that. And um, I've had good friends in the past. Um, a, a friend who was an English faculty member at uh, my former university, she and I would compare notes about books. And so, it was always nice to have somebody you could do that with. And uh, especially you feel a little, um, um, a, a little uh, like you're, you're behind this person who's an English faculty member and you talk to them about books. You feel like you'll come across as, as not being knowledgeable, but it was always really great to, to talk to her about. Um, and so I missed that one part of it. So I saw her recently and I, she and I, she and I picked right back up again. What have you been reading? Okay. And uh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. I relate to, I remember, um, how it's always been a saying of like, oh, if you're, if you're having trouble sleeping, like read a chapter before bed or like do some reading before bed and that'll make you sleepy. And I used to never relate to that because I was like, if I read before bed, I was like, that's about to keep me up. I was like, I'm going to start having questions and I'm, if it's a good book, I'm going to get hooked into it and I'm not going to want to put it down. So I used to never understand that saying, I was like, reading doesn't make me sleep. I was like, it makes me wake up even when I'm tired, it makes me interested. I'd say that, you know, one of the the challenges is is of of my job of of doing this job is it's 24 seven, a lot of the time. And so it is hard to drop when I want to fall asleep. It's hard to get rid of because it's still worrying in my mind what I need to do as far as a decision or to, to work on for, for something. And so if I think that that's what um, detours me from that, that you know, spiraling thoughts about work is, is that if I read it just kind of, it, it resets as Mm -hmm. as I'm speaking, right. It resets the brain to say, okay, I've thought about something else. I've given mental energy to something that is not work that doesn't have any immediate 
um, consequences or, or action required. It's just being able to read and sort of to enjoy that. Now, you know, when it's something like knife where it's, it's really hard to read, it's, it's difficult reading about someone's recovery. And, and so, or if it's something that's really, you know, very negative book, I mean, one would think, yeah, you would have trouble, but I guess my alternative to that is like, well, I could also think about work for another hour before I fall <laughs> and I'll do that. So <laughs> I'll read instead. Yeah. Well, it's for, you know, how they say reading's a form of escapism. You might not always be escaping to a better place, but at least it's something that's not your personal dealings, you know, exactly. your personal issues, even if you're escaping to something where it's hard to get through, at least that's not your own problems, you know? I think people underestimate just how much, just how vast reading is too. I mean, like you can scroll on your phone and go through mm -hmm. Facebook and read your friend's posts or whatever and Twitter or the news, you know, it's easier to, now than ever to read the news from all over the world. Like that's still reading. It doesn't just because it's not, you know, a bound book with the storyline or whatever, it's, you're still reading something. If you're doing, you know, you're doing your taxes, that's reading. Um, it's, it might not be the most fun or engaging thing in the world, but like, yeah, people who say they don't read, I think they don't really grasp just how much reading they do in their life and how much we have to read as people uh mm -hmm. it's it's just kind of a shame that people don't really think about reading as just a just a thing that you're doing passively all the time it's like um the video game industry charts people who who play mobile games the exact same way that they chart people who buy the big 60 70 dollar tentpole releases like for for other industries, it, it doesn't matter how you're reading or it doesn't matter what games you're playing. It just matters that you are doing it. That's really all anyone's like people who actually track that stuff. They don't track the exact kind of thing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're out there and you're thinking that you just don't have time to read or you don't read or whatever, uh, you probably do. You just maybe you're just not thinking about it in that kind of way, that context. Well, there's a there's an author I follow that um, she she writes more about, you know, life management and stuff like that but she talked about making a goal you know one of her her goals was to read war and peace you know it's the classic sort of i'm going to read this really long dense novel but she read it in chunks of small amounts on her phone while she was waiting in line somewhere she read all of shakespeare's sonnets you know in in the course of going through um you know her day to day so i think it's also in addition to that chris it's also um the, the the notion that reading is sitting down with a with a paper book and you sit down and you do nothing but and that you you know your consumption of it is 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 determined by and so I think that that's when they say they don't read it's like they're not really thinking broadly or even about the opportunities reading short stories or poetry or something like that that that's a chance to read something short form beyond just I think they're only thinking long form and, and it's not just like it's not just that you don't have to be sitting down with that in your hand it's that you can be reading another way that is however it is that you like to read and whatever it is that you like to read it doesn't necessarily have to be how other people view these things um, just recently i had a friend of mine saying that they they had a goal of like 100 books a year and i was like yeah that's no I'm not gonna do that um but i read tons and tons of manga all the time <laughs> basically like that's that's my reading material because i'm a uh uh I have brain rot that's been going on for 20 plus years. Uh, and I said that, I was like, ah, I've just been reading this one manga lately. And they were like, uh, it's words on a thing. Like, it doesn't matter that it's not uh, a book. Like, it's still reading something. So that's been that's been helping me out with thinking about reading too lately. Yeah. That makes me think of the conversation around audiobooks as well. I remember when audiobooks first they've been around obviously for a while but when they first kind of started getting popular especially like on phones and like you know audible and all these other ways to do it and I remember I would see so many people being like well it doesn't count as reading like listening to an audiobook it does and I even hear people still say it today they're like it doesn't count because you didn't actually read it you listen to it and I'm like I don't understand why it doesn't count I consume the story mm -hmm. I know what happened I could tell you what happened in this story I could tell you dialogue from the characters just because I didn't read it with my eyes doesn't mean I didn't partake in this story and what it is so makes me think of that too like there's so many other forms of reading than just sitting down and cracking open a book and being like all right today I am going to read this book <laughs> you don't have to just do it that way 
so so one of my favorite audiobooks um in that way because it is done differently you know and and because you get the interpretation of it um is world war z um so again oh. i said i like dystopian things i secretly like zombie stuff and so <laughs> world war z they they bring in so many different people to read the stories because it's a collection of stories post post you know pre during and post um but there's like sam waterston and mark hamill and all these amazing voices oh. that they have interpreting the the book and it's really incredible and so i'll come back to that one again and again i've read the book but i've also sort of had the chance to experience it that way too and it's really amazing um because the, the people they've chosen um uh, who is it? richard armitage who's um actor um he's he's great as an audiobook reader because you get this voice that's incredible um and and he gets you into the story the way he tells it and the you know the way the author has has done it so you see this also amazing work that goes into producing that too oh yeah uh well marcy um not to rush or anything but uh mm -hmm. we we're coming up on the hour and there were a few things that allison had, had mentioned that she wanted to ask you as well and we <laughs> do want to see if Joe has anything coming up in the community. So we may need to, uh, we may need to go through these next questions a little, um, uh, uh, with, without as much commentary for me at the very least. Sure. Well, you mentioned, um, earlier about your job and, you know, how it comes with it's 24 seven. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of times where you need a second to unplug from that. So we know that this year, this past semester, the spring 2024 semester was your first official semester mm -hmm. as provost before you were interim uh, provost. But I wanted to ask, how was that first semester for you? Was it challenging? Do you feel like you adapted? Well, you know, how did it go for you? Um, well, I feel like it went well. I'm sure there are other people who have different opinions. I'm sure that they may have made, made, have made a decision that made people unhappier or however that had happened. And I don't take that lightly. I mean, it does mean something to me when people dislike something I decided or I did. Um, you know, I think I was able to, to, to set more goals in terms of the longer term thinking, you know, you're thinking so short term when you're doing an interim job, even though there are long term decisions to be made, um, doing a little bit more long term thinking, especially when it comes to, for me, um, I like to be able to use data to, to drive my decisions. So being able to dig into the data, uh, you know, and and try to to develop a solution that is data driven. So um, an example I, I feel has been really I, I'm proud of that I was able to work on was to try to get the summer lineup of courses set early enough and have an idea of how much things would cost and also help the university where previously it didn't have, it had neither an expense nor a revenue line for summer. <laughs> they, they were, you know, we had been working in like summer will happen and, and we put on summer what is on summer and that that's not strategic at all. Um, and so working with finding, okay, here's the revenue line, here's an expense line, let's try to work on that and say, you know, and so where we are is really good for summer. I feel like we've offered the classes we need to do and, um, and done it so in a, in a financially prudent way. Uh, so that feels like it's been a, a good turn. And so um, for me, that that spring semester had a lot. I mean, there's a lot happening, but um, you know, we 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 accomplished you know submitting some curricular um, new curricular initiatives into the the system um, to have approved, and that will be affecting or going into effect in the fall. Uh, working on. Um, working with Dr. Haney and getting to have her and, you know, her, she and I have having some more sense of permanence um, that we can then start to set some goals together. Um, she's a great person to work for and to work with. And when it comes to setting, setting goals um, and then I'm lining up the summer, I have, I have a whole lot of projects for the summer that some of them are data related and some of them are team building development. Um, so we had in the spring um, two dean searches and a director search for the museum, and so going through those was a, it's 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 it gives me a chance to build some of the team in academic affairs, and then we're going to work on in in June, and then again in August we'll have in June a retreat for my direct reports that are not deans, um, and at least one other person from their area to get together and talk about um, how they can collaborate. And then with the deans in August, once the new dean, um, and one of the new deans comes on board in August. And so I'm I'm happy to start thinking about how do we launch into the fall um, really well. But it's it's intimidating to look at that list of projects to do for the summer and see what I have to 
handle. I was just, um, I was just away. Um, so I took my son to New York city. We took, we were there from Thursday until yesterday and we got in oh, there wow. last night and, uh, I had to intentionally tell the deans, okay, I'm, I'm not going to be answering questions. I'm going to unplug for this four days so that I can <laughs> do that. So that when I come back, I can be fully on task and, and, and ready to go. And so, um, so I could spend that time with him, but yeah. So I feel like it was a success, um, trying to wrap my head around things that we hadn't wrapped our heads around every, every day brings, um, something new. Um, I haven't had a day that hasn't. Uh, so that's always, um, uh, interesting. Interesting is, is, um, what I get a lot of the time. So that's all right. Yeah. Keep you on your toes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know we're getting close here. Like we said to the hour, I don't know if I, if we should ask more or if we should start wrapping up towards the end here. What I think is Dr. Marsden, if you have time later, uh, maybe in this fall semester or some other point, I think there are plenty of other questions that we do have to ask. Um, if you have time, if you would like to join us for a future installment. I'd be happy to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have to answer questions now or happy to answer questions later. And, and it's one of those things I, I, I really enjoy talking to people about what this office does and who the people working in this office are, which is really good. Um, I think the provost doesn't get as much interaction with other places as deans do, as faculty do. And so it's really important to be able to have that interaction. Um, mm -hmm. have a, yeah. So I'd be well, happy no to one said it before. We, we see all that you've done for us and we're extraordinarily grateful for, for everything that you do. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it means it, it's when I tell people what is under this office's umbrella, you know, you look at, okay, you have seven or six academic colleges plus the graduate school. Plus then you have another 10 people outside of that who are, who are reporting in, in vast different areas. You know, I'm the retreat I'm having next week with some of those, um, those other groups that one of the things I'm hoping to do in academic affairs is, um, I'm calling it speed meeting, but it's based on like a speed dating sort of thing, having people five minutes at a time from different areas, talk to each other to say, how could we work together? How could we cross the, the, the boundaries of our disciplines and our areas and try to work together? And so I'm really anxious to get that sort of stuff started. Cause I think there there's, I mean, I'm just excited about what can emerge just from people talking to you all about, you know, what could happen between sponsored programs in the library or the museum in the library or from our um, honors program library. I mean, we are, we can, if we even just mentioning that it calls to mind a whole lot of things that could happen. And I think that's what's really going to be fun to do in the fall. So being a little more creative in addition to being sort of functional as, as, as provost is what I'm looking forward to doing. Oh, yeah. Well, very cool. That is very exciting. We're, we're looking forward to, to working with you with all that stuff. Absolutely. A full time of collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, did you have any community events that you wanted to talk about before we sign off? Uh, yes, I do. There's a, a few things. Um, some of these uh, I may have mentioned uh, last month, too, but they're still happening. So, you know, uh, the Texoma Community Credit Union is partnering with downtown Wichita Falls to bring you Take It Outside. It's a community picnic series, uh, June 14th and June 28th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Park Central, 8th and Scott. You can grab a to-go order from your favorite downtown eatery and join your neighbors for great food, fun, fellowship, and festive live music. Downtown Wichita Falls Development is presenting Movies at the Market uh, at the farmer's market on June 14th, you can go down there and they'll be showing Lilo and Stitch. Uh, Wichita Falls Museum of Art at MSU Texas is hosting Live at the Lake Arts at the Pavilion on June 20th at 6.30. You can enjoy live painting by Anthony Campos, performances by Zavala International Dancers and an art activity for the kids. Wichita Theater has performances of Shrek the Musical in June and July. The next After Hours Art Walk will be in downtown Wichita Falls on July 11th. Um, normally that's uh, the like the first Thursday of the month, but uh, this in July, that'll be the fourth, which has- There's something happening on the fourth? Um, I'm sorry, Chris, what did you say? I'm sorry. I'm kidding. Okay. 
All right. Uh, the museum will be hosting uh, weaving workshops on July 11th and 13th. Uh, you can learn the basics of weaving and see how textiles influence texture in artwork. Uh, Backdoor Theater's summer youth musical this year is Cinderella. Uh, and then looking ahead to the fall semester, uh, we already have some things that we know are going to be happening uh, here at the library. Rooftop Heroes. It's a pop culture mini convention celebrating fictional heroes in all their forms. We'll be returning for its second year at Moffat Library on Thursday, October 31st. Uh, we will have speakers and presentations all afternoon and a costume contest to close out the event. We'll have a vendor area with student organization fundraisers and campus artists will display their work in an artist's row. If you'd like more information on participation, you can call 940-397-4091 or email uh, joseph.mcneely at msutexas.edu. And Moffat Library will be celebrating Children's Book Week with daily readings Monday, November 4th through Sunday, November 10th. And all of these things that are further away we'll have more information on as we get a little bit closer to them. If you have an event you'd like us to announce or if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for any or all of us, please send an email to library at msutexas.edu. Or if you'd like more information about the things that I mentioned today and other local activities, check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage and the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. That's it. All right, good stuff. I, I think we got a podcast recorded. Anyone have anything else to mention? <laughs> all right, oh, our studio. All of our studio. Yes. One Check more time, just to great. mention, <laughs> we have the Mustang Studio here at the library, and we are open again this summer. Our library is open past 5 p.m., so... If you want to use this studio for podcasts, audio recordings, anything like that, you can find more information on our website. Yeah, I'm anxious to tell some of the new faculty hires and um, other new hires in academic affairs about the opportunity. I have a feeling that there's some people that would be interested in that for some of the course activities and so forth. Oh, yeah, we've already gotten some interest from professors, so that'd be great to get more people coming in here and using this for their classes. Sure. That would be great. Well, from all of us here at Moffat Library, uh, thank you all for listening, and we will see you again next time.